Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the New England Public Library. I am Liza Bernard, the programming librarian here, and um, I want to uh, mention that we are co-hosting this uh, afternoon event with the Yankee Bookshop, and Carrie and Christian very generously donated a portion of the book back to the library so we can continue putting on programs like this. So um, I just want to uh, note that. And I also want to thank WCTV, who is here yet again filming the program, so that you can share with friends afterwards, or go back and review a bit if you missed it, or um, <coughs> go in and see some of the other events you didn't make it to. It's, it, when, when it's ready, it'll be posted on their website and the Norman Williams website. So the format today is pretty straightforward. Um, brief introduction, but to keep it brief, because you want to hear from these folks. Um, and then they will be opening up to Q&A towards the end of the hour. Afterwards, Ben will stay up here to sign books, and you can purchase books back there. He'll either be here or at the little table there. Okay, oh, reminder, turn off your cell phones and other distracting devices, please. Um, okay, so, um, well, Tanya and Ben Mesrich live most of their time in Boston with their two kids and two dogs. We are very lucky to have them as part-time residents here in our community in Vermont. Tanya Mesrich attended Tufts University where she studied French literature, art history, and eventually dentistry. <laughs> she established her own jewelry and clothing lines, opening the first Boston Fashion Week tent with her clothing, clothing brand, Mike and Tom. This led her to be tapped as a resident fashion and style expert at NBC Boston and to co-host the TV show Style Boston, as well as create and host the popular Boston's Red Carpet, both on NESM. For the past year, she's been the lifestyle editor of Boston Magazine, where she writes and shares stories and insights. With Ben, she has penned a series of books for young readers, the most recent being Charlie Numbers and the UFA, UFO Bash, which came out this past uh, late summer. Uh, one of the books in the series, Charlie Numbers and the Man on the Moon, was chosen as the required summer reading for all the sixth graders in the Boston Public Schools, which is quite an quite a, um, accolade. Hmm. The su success of the books has attracted the attention of Alan Pompeo from Grey's Anatomy, who plans to develop them into an exciting movie series. Stay tuned. Hmm. Ben Mesrich is a very busy man, also. <laughs> In addition to writing for young readers, which I just mentioned, he has published two dozen best-selling books over the past 20 years and helped turn several into hit movies. These are creative nonfiction books that tend to focus on young geniuses, their battles and their successes, and they include Bringing Down the House, uh, the inside story of six MIT students who took Vegas for millions, it spent more than a year on the New York Times bestseller list, and it was adapted into a motion picture. The Accidental Billionaires, their fo the founding of Facebook, A Tale of Sex, Money, Genius, and Betrayal, spent 18 weeks on the New York Times list and um, was adapted into the movie The Social Network, which was, uh, it garnered eight Oscar nominees and won three, and also three Golden Globes. And uh, Ben uh, shares the prestigious Scripter Award for Best Adopted adapted screenplay for that one. And then there's a, another one called the Anti-Social Network, which is now uh, entitled Dumb Money, the GameStop Short Squeeze, and the ragtag group of amateur traders who brought Wall Street to its knees, which was also made into a movie starring Pete Davidson, Seth Rogen, and America Ferrara. Ever a writer on the cutting edge, Ben's new book, Breaking Twitter portrays three years of Elon Musk's life and involvement in the social media platform beginning in April 2020, which is now, as we speak, melting down. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, please welcome our guests, Tanya and Ben Mesrich. Um, thank you guys for coming out. I just want to say a huge thanks to our Vermont family for coming on this. This is probably our, our one of our last events of the book tour, but we're so happy to be spending it with all of you. So thank you guys for coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, you have covered some of the biggest topics in the news, such as Facebook and GameStop, and now you're tackling Elon Musk and Twitter. Um, the 
Zuckerberg and Elon had a throwdown plan, and it's kind of been put on hold because of their various injuries. What draws you to stories like this, like about this. these kind of people? Sure, and first of all, I want to say thank you so much for everybody coming out. This is an incredible venue, and uh, you know, Vermont is our second home. We lived here for three solid years um, during COVID and only had to go back. Uh, for the kids' school, and we wish we were here all the time. <laughs> so we absolutely love it, and thank you. And yeah, so uh, there was almost a fight. Uh, Elon challenged Zuckerberg to a fist fight, uh, an MMA fight, um, wanted to do it in the Coliseum of all places, and then even showed up at Zuckerberg's house and just wanted to fight him on his back lawn. Um, and Zuckerberg, <laughs> I think, smartly ran away from it so far, <laughs> but it might still happen. We'll see. Um, so I am, I always want to write stories about people who are doing important things that are changing our culture. So I'm always looking for origin stories of something that's enormous enough that it changes everything after it. So the founding of Facebook or, or something about biotechnology. And when I came to sort of breaking Twitter, um, before Elon bought Twitter, I was a big Elon fan. I always thought this is a guy who is moving us forward in so many ways, you know, Tesla, creating a, uh, you know, e-cars that are going to save the environment, that are going to drive themselves. SpaceX, he's going to get us to Mars. This is incredible stuff. Up until a year ago, I would have put him in the category of an Edison or an Einstein. He's the kind of guy that Walter Isaacson would write a book about, right? <laughs> but today, it is a very different Elon Musk. He's roundly hated by at least half the world, if not more. Um, he's seen as a, a man-child doing really, really crazy things, pushing conspiracy theories. The site is dwindling and spiraling out of control. And the tagline of the book is, Elon Musk didn't just break Twitter, Twitter broke Elon Musk. So what really drew me to this story was this drama of a man who was really reaching heights that nobody really has reached before and is now brought incredibly low by his own actions and we've either revealed him to be who he always was, or he's dramatically changed over the past year. And that's really what the story is about. So I write narrative nonfiction, I write thrillers about real people, but I write it in a cinematic movie style. And so for me, this was a movie coming to life in front of us. Yeah, and you mentioned that he's sort of falling apart. I know the news. By the way, I love the fact that Tanya is interviewing <laughs> me because she, she is forced to listen to what I'm saying. Um, and, and not, you know. Well, <laughs> not, he told me not, not, not to interview him. Has anyone seen uh, Anchorman? Ron yeah. Burgundy. Ron Burgundy. <laughs> he Tanya said not to read the teleprompter. Yeah, read it. She's the unworthy to actually <laughs> listen to what <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, the media has also, you know, touched upon what you were saying in the book with Elon kind of spiraling down with yeah. sort, you know, his mental state is not great. What, yeah, what do you I have mean, to so say I've about that? Yeah, I mean, so I've been doing a bunch of press this week. Some of you might have seen me on Morning Joe, did CNBC Squawk, and what. I haven't really been talking about the mental illness angle of it because I'm not a psychiatrist and I'm not a person who can really make um, a determination of what Elon's actual mental state is. But there is a scene in the book that you know I think I was the first to report where he reached such a low point. Uh, he had tweeted a poll whether saying, should I remain CEO? Some of you may remember when he tweeted this. And he fully expected the poll to come back. Yes, of course, we love you, Elon, because that's how he'd been treated most of his adult life. And the actual poll came back, no, you should definitely leave. <laughs> and he freaked out to the point where he locked himself in a conference room for 24 hours, um, or you know, a full day, basically. And nobody could get in there. And the Twitter employees were so concerned about his mental health that they were going to call in a wellness check with the San Francisco Police Department because they thought he was going to kill himself. So the reality is, he is fragile. Um, he has done some things that are, are quite sort of frightening and, and sort of point to the potential of something going on there. Um, but it has been the hosts on the shows I've been doing who've been saying he's mentally ill. I have not said not Elon yet. is mentally ill. Uh, <laughs> he calls himself on the spectrum. Um, he's said that a few times. But I definitely think he is going through some major issues right now and, and has reached some really low points. And, you know, he's, he's sort of been obsessed with truth. Yes. And that has also sort of been the downfall of of why it hasn't worked with what he's how he's tried to sort of over control Twitter and now he calls it X. Can you speak more about that and yeah. and why that sort of yeah so spiral? Elon you know his motivations for for taking Twitter I think we should get into the motivations for taking Twitter. So Elon came into this for what he saw as very noble reasons. 
He believed that Twitter was supposed to be a place for free speech and truth. And he felt like it was being taken over by something he called the woke mind virus. Um, this is a little convoluted, but he believed that this woke mind virus was shutting down free speech, was canceling people, was throwing off people from the site that he felt had a legitimate you know, thing to say, and that truth was getting swallowed up. And he believes that we're in this window of time when humanity can get to Mars. That's the most important thing. Because if we get to Mars, we're a multi-planetary species and we won't be destroyed by an asteroid or a nuclear war. Um, and so he felt like if Twitter disappeared, um, then we would lose this opportunity to get to Mars. It's a little convoluted, but that's really what he believes. Um, so he took Twitter, or originally offered to take Twitter, because he wanted to protect free speech and truth. Now, we've actually reached a point where Twitter is the least true place on the internet. It's a, it's a, it's a disaster of a site full of lies and hate and anti-Semitism. Um, advertisers don't want to be there anymore. It's financially in a disaster point. But he came into it because he felt like he was doing the right thing. But then a series of things happened that affected him personally that drove him to this place where it became the direct opposite of what he was trying to do. And you know, in that series of things that happened, can you enlighten us more about these troll farms? Yeah, what are troll they farms. and how did so, that affect? Interestingly enough, when Elon first took over the site, um, and the very first day, there was a troll attack on Twitter. So over 50,000 hate tweets came out, racist tweets, anti-Semitic tweets, and these were actually paid for. This is a, an interesting part of the story that people don't really talk about, but there was a troll farm. There are numerous troll farms. So these are basically companies. They're usually in former Soviet republics where they'll hire 150 people who will each sit with 10 phones with 10 fake accounts. And you can hire this group to attack anything you want to attack. Um, they'll, they can spew hate, or they can go after a political person, they can go after a company. It's basically pay to order trolls who will go on the internet. It's not automated, it's not bots, it's actually people. And there was a troll attack on Twitter the first week that he took over. Um, now Elon's responses have been very bad to this. He wants to get rid of the bots, which is probably a good thing, but his belief in free speech, which is ideologically a good thing, actually becomes a very difficult thing when you're running a, a social network that's full of trolls because you can't really allow all of this horrible speech on there and keep advertisers. And so from the very beginning, it became a battle. All of the advertisers wanted to leave the minute he took over. The first thing he did was he did this horrible conspiracy theory tweet where basically Paul Pelosi was attacked with a hammer. We all kind of know this story. In the book, I describe it from the point of view of Paul Pelosi. You know, this 80-something-year-old man wakes up in his bed, and there's a man standing at the edge of his bed holding a hammer. Uh, it's a brutal scene. The man beats him with a hammer and nearly kills him. Uh, Elon Musk, meanwhile, is at Heidi Klum's Hollywood party where she's dressed as a worm for Halloween. He's running around this crazy party. He comes out, and then he tweets this conspiracy tweet. He retweets a conspiracy, the idea that it was some sort of gay tryst that led to Paul Pelosi's beating. It's a horrible tweet. It's a horrible thing to tweet. He regrets it very quickly afterwards, and he erased the tweet, but not before all the advertisers see this and just start leaving Twitter, because nobody wants to advertise next to this garbage. And this is the beginning of this cycle of things that happen, and that's the first step. He starts to go you know, thermonuclear, Elon calls it, where he threatens his advertisers on Twitter, saying, if you don't come back to Twitter, I'm going to name and shame you and get my followers to go after you and boycott you. This is not good behavior of a CEO of a company. It doesn't work out for him. And then the next thing that happens um, is he destroys the blue check system. And we can, you know, I don't know if you have, I know you want to, I, I know your script. You I have my that. script, yeah, yeah. but you can get into <laughs> the blue check. Yeah, yeah, get into the blue check controversy yeah. because so, I think that, that, you know, drove a lot of people crazy, especially mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, you know, the media, intellectuals, and the, the, intellectuals the celebrities, everybody so It used everybody to be on Twitter, crazy. and I know you all kind of remember this, some of you and some of you don't. Uh, there used to be a system where they gave blue checks to people they considered journalists, educated people, intellectuals, celebrities, uh, pol politicians, and sometimes they sold them. I mean, there was some corruption in the blue check system. It was very weird how you got one. Suddenly you would just wake up and you'd have a blue check if you were you know, How did decided, you get yours? I think you got it for me. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a wife like Tanya, you might find a way to a blue check. Um, but what was good about the blue check system is it vetted people. You knew that someone who had a blue check was the person they said they were. 
So if you were talking to um, AOC uh, and she had a blue check, you knew that was actually her, as opposed to a random person claiming to be her. And so you would go on Twitter and you might want to read about a plane crash. And you could find real pilots and you could re find real engineers and real scientists. Or you want to read about COVID. And this is where it gets a little crazy. But at the time, you could go on and see a real you know, biologist from Harvard talking about it. And you knew they really were who they said they were. Um, Elon decided this was not fair. This was not egalitarian. His real motivation is that he hates journalists uh, because he's at war with all the journalists who attack him. And a lot of blue check people were journalists. So he wanted to get rid of journalists as a class from Twitter. So he decided the blue check from now on will be $8. You buy a blue check, and your posts are going to be boosted. So instead of vetting important people who might know something, we're now giving anyone who has $8 the chance to say whatever they want. From an egalitarian point of view, this is great. Everyone can say what they want. From a website point of view, it's horrific, because if you look at Twitter now, all of the comments that you see right away are the worst comments. They look like they're written by my 13-year-old. They're full of hate and you know, yelling. Not that my son is full of hate, but I'm just saying teenagers write a certain way. And a lot of the internet now looks like it's written by teenagers. Um, and there's not a lot of intellectual stuff going on. And so even though it is leveling the playing field by getting rid of an unfair system, it replaces it with a complete circus. Um, the way it was launched was horrible. The day it launched, all of these fake blue check people came up playing, pretending to be real people. So Eli Lilly's official blue check site suddenly said, insulin is free. And there was a, a George Bush going on, let's bomb the Muslims, right? And then there was, there was a, a, a yeah, Mario Kart uh, with his middle finger up, right, from the Nintendo site. It was thing, and I have them all in the book, but they're just hysterical. There was like, I forget, McDonald's did something. There were all these fake sites doing crazy stuff. And Elon was sitting in a conference room laughing louder and louder. He thought this was hysterical um, until the people at Twitter told him, you know, this is destroying the site. And then he shut that down, relaunched the blue left check. But in the end, it really was a disaster. And that was kind of the first big disaster he did at Twitter. Is that, in your mind, like sort of the beginning of That's the, the end beginning of, of the end because he like, does things like this with his rockets where he'll blow something up and then rebuild it because that's how you reach the edge of something. But with Twitter, when you blow something up, you lose something, and you can't just restart from where you blew it up. And what he doesn't realize is it's, uh, free speech, social media, is a lot harder than building rocket ships, because it's not something you can just engineer. It involves people. So the two things he did right away, well, the three things he did right away that were bad was the Paul Pelosi tweet, which he recognized as a mistake. He fired everybody. I mean, he walked in and fired a company of 7,500 people is down to under 1,000 people. Uh, and he fired people, whole teams of people that were doing important things. So like things didn't work anymore. Um, the lights would go off. You know, a lot of things went wrong. He fired the guy that had the password to get into the building at one point. And <laughs> employees were stuck outside and couldn't get in um, because they had fired the guy with the password. Um, and then the blue check system was a complete revamping and destroyed, you know, all the celebrities left. All of the journalists either left or were still sort of there. Um, but all of the power users left the site. And in their places, <laughs> Um, were just a lot of Elon fans, um, which are usually right-wing people. It became more and more rightward as, as he you know, got bigger and bigger. So those were the first things that happened. And then a lot of personal things started to happen. He went on stage with Dave Chappelle, and he got booed. And this was the first time in his life where he's ever been booed in person. And he reacted very poorly to that. And he came back to Twitter. And by that next day, he was tweeting, oh, I think it was only 10% of the crowd that was booing. But if you listen to the tapes, it's the whole <laughs> crowd is booing him. Um, after the booing, um, his car got attacked. This was a famous story. Um, there was a website on, on Twitter that was tracking his jet, and they had tracked his jet to LA, and his limo with his son X in it, um, his son is named X, was, uh, was accosted by a stalker, which is a horrible thing. Elon freaked out, and in the middle of the night, he went on Twitter, and he started throwing off journalists. And he threw off dozens of journalists who had tweeted bad things about him. So all of his free speech just went out the window when it became personal. And he threw so many of them off that there was outcry, and he had to rescind and let them all back on to Twitter. Um, but it showed you him spiraling. He got really, really paranoid. And he started to make a rule. He made a rule at Twitter that no more than two employees were allowed to gather together at a time, um, because he believed there was going to be a mutiny, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, this is crazy behavior. He walks around with two giant bodyguards at all times in his own company, which he never did at SpaceX. He never did no. at Tesla. 
But at Twitter, he has bodyguards waiting outside his room at all times. Um, and, uh, and then he tweeted the poll and ended up almost, you know, so locking himself in a conference room. And this is sort of the, the, where Elon becomes this very different person. He's paranoid. He's surrounded by only right-wing voices because they're not talking back to him. And he's, he's trying to strike out at the major media, which he feels like is attacking him. So he's leaning in more and more to conspiracy theories. And I think that leads us all the way to today, where in the last couple of days, you know, he's tweeted some horrific stuff and has chased all the rest of the advertisers off the site. And he's suing the ADL, you know, the Anti-Defamation League, claiming that they're conspiring against Twitter. Um, these are very sort of anti-Semitic themes that he's toying with. Um, now, I've been on a couple of news shows in the last couple of days. I don't personally believe, and people push back on this, and that's totally fair, I don't think Elon is anti-Semitic. I don't think Elon personally sees himself that way, but I think he flirts with these conspiracy theories because, number one, he wants drama. He loves drama. And number two, he doesn't seem to feel it himself. People, uh, Kara Swisher is one who said to me, this is a guy who's never been a subjugated group or, or someone who's felt this. And so to him, it doesn't seem real when he makes these statements and stuff like that. So either he's unaware of how anti-Semitic he's coming off, um, or he's just having fun in his own really weird, childish way. But I personally don't think he is anti-Semitic. But anyways, um, that's the big story right now. Is it's, it's devolved into this kind of crazy place over the last couple of weeks, which there's no advertising left on the site. And when he took over, 90% of its revenue came through advertising. 90%. Now, you know, where's the money coming from? Subscription, but that's a tiny thing. Nobody wants to do that. Um, so the site is really spiraling down. Yeah, I mean, he Bloomberg is now reporting that it's worth less than half of what he paid for it. Well, Bloomberg claimed it's you... like 18 billion because that's what Twitter said. Yeah. But in the last couple of days, I've read some stuff where they don't think it's worth 8 billion. Oh. My um, God. So the site is really it's a dramatic loss from a 44 billion dollar company to a 10 let's say 10 billion dollar company in the span of a year. Um, and it was one of the best, most well-known brands in the world, Twitter, and now it's X, which sounds like a porn website. And <laughs> he was actually, he tried to make PayPal called X, and that's the reason he was fired from PayPal originally. He loves this X.com idea, um, but it just seems like a really bad idea. Yeah, I mean, do you think he would have, do you think he regrets paying that much for it? And yes. Like, do you I, think, I think he, if he, he could go back in I mean, time, I, he would have I know, I talked to a lot of insiders of with him. You know, he needs to win. He needs the scoreboard to say Elon wins. So in public, he says, oh, this is all part of the growing pains of making it this everything app, which is really a pivot. He's pivoting away from global town hall of freedom, because that's just down the drain now. And now he's pivoting to everything app. It's going to be a payment place, a dating website he's talking about. Um, it's going to be a, a totally different site now with a chat room full of right-wing anti-Semitic voices. That's the direction it seems to be going. And I don't think that was his goal originally. So yes, I think he genuinely regrets buying it. And Twitter you know, sort of reacted and brought in the cleanup crew, Linda Yaccarino. Yes, Linda. Well, right. What do you think about Linda and mm. what, what's, what's her role? And so how's Linda that is a very out? competent executive from NBC who is very good with the advertisers. So she was brought in as like a Band-Aid. Uh, it's like how Sheryl Sandberg was brought in to make Mark Zuckerberg look like a real boy. Uh, that was Sheryl's <laughs> job, was to be the adult in the room. Uh, and, and, but Sheryl was able to control things to the point where she did have real power there. And I think Cheryl actually did a wonderful job in the beginning. And then in the end, she got caught up in, in a lot of the mess that Mark got caught up in. But you know, it is amazing that Elon has made Zuckerberg look good, <laughs> which seems like you know, a hard thing to do. And he makes like, Bezos looks fantastic, right? <laughs> He's just you know, in pictures in his truck with his, <laughs> with his cowboy hat. Right, with his cowboy hat. Um, so yes, I think Linda's job was to try and fix things, but she has no power over there. And every time she tries to do something, Elon undermines it with a horrible tweet. So the idea that she can bring back advertisers when Elon keeps on doing the things he's doing, it's impossible. I don't believe she'll be there for much longer. I would be amazed if she makes it six months more. Yeah, and... But like, she took an opportunity. I mean, it was an opportunity to become CEO of a major company, but I think she'll regret it too, because I think her re reputation is going down the drain as well. Oh, yeah. Elon's taken everyone down. <laughs> everyone down right. um, so when he took over Twitter, in the beginning, he was more left 
leftist or even centrist, but now I would say he, was, he called himself centrist, but he definitely was an Obama voter. He was a supporter of Biden. Um, you know, he was making electric cars, so he should have been, you know, seen very well by by the Democratic Party. However, the Democratic Party had always had problems with Elon um, and wasn't fair to him around Tesla, in my opinion. Uh, they never really saw Tesla as the important thing that it was. They were always pushing Ford's electric car or, or someone else's electric car, not realizing that Tesla was surpassing everybody in this industry. Um, they should have been way behind him more than they were. Um, but now, yes, he has shifted way, way right. And I've seen him in interviews where he'll say, well, I'm just moving center, but it appears right to all of you because you're all on the left. Um, but that's not at all what we see, right? He's actually endorsing a lot of very right-wing voices on Twitter. And by endorsing them, they became the character of the site because he has so many followers that anyone he likes or retweets becomes a major user of Twitter. So it shifts the whole culture just by him liking a tweet. Um, and you have to remember, his tweets are amplified by a 1,000. You'll read it in my book, but it was the Super Bowl last year, and he tweeted something and President Biden tweeted something. And Biden's tweet got 15 times more likes than Elon, and Elon flipped out. And in the middle of the night, he called a meeting. All his engineers were taking at 2 in the morning to Twitter, and they were told, you're all fired if I'm not getting more likes than Biden by the morning. I mean, it's some, and so basically, they worked all night, and they amplified Elon's tweets by 1,000. So anything Elon tweeted, everybody saw. Um, and that's, that's again, but, but part that, of this evaluation. That, of, isn't that sort of against free speech yeah, in a I mean, way? Like this is the thing about the free the speech algorithm? argument. And then there's so much of a free speech argument going on. Elon is not for free speech um, when it comes to him personally. I mean, he's going to sue the ADL. He's going to sue Media Matters now. Um, he wants to amplify his own tweets. The idea of free speech is a beautiful thing. <clears throat> But in practice, free speech always has guardrails, especially on the internet. I mean, again, I go back to having a teenage kid. I have a teenager, and he does not have free speech in the house, right? You can't just say whatever he wants. We've all, a lot of you have raised teenagers. And the internet is full of teenagers. It just is. Any site that has more free speech turns more and more ugly, because there's tons of trolls, and there's tons of people who just want to spout hate. And if you allow that in, it just becomes an unusable site very quickly. So the idea of free speech is wonderful and important to support. But what it means is journalists should be able to say what they want as long as within certain boundaries. There's no such thing as absolute free speech anywhere. And I don't think a site like Twitter can run in a, if it's absolute free speech. And Elon knows this. And he himself will throw people off Twitter if they say things that he doesn't like. Um, so he's not a free speech absolutist any more than anyone else is, but he likes to use that as a weapon when people criticize him. Yeah, like tell us a little bit about shadow banning and, yeah, so, and the algorithm and how to, like that yeah, to so me doesn't one seem One of the like concepts that Elon uses, but he didn't invent it, it actually came from previous people, is the idea of freedom of reach, not freedom of speech. So you can say what you want on Twitter, but maybe no one will see it. Um, in the past, it was advertisers who'd made a lot of that determination. If something wasn't going to be palatable for advertisers, no one would ever see that tweet. Um, but now the algorithm is a little more complex than that. Um, there's something called shadow banning, where you might tweet something and it will only go to certain numbers of people. Um, it's, very, it's very mercurial and it's very hard to know what's really going on. But the idea is there's no such thing as a level playing field. It's, there's no such thing as sort of freedom on the internet. And it's a private company, nor should there be freedom on a private company. I mean, they have some level of control of what they allow on their site. But the idea is um, you, it can't just be a free-for-all, or it can't function that way. So in a way, the way they're tinkering with the algorithm mm -hmm. is sort of like its own simulation. Simulation. And can you speak a little bit about how Elon lives his life as if he's in a sim? And... Oh, I like this segue. <laughs> good. good segue. Um, so Elon believes in something called simulation theory. And this is a big part of the story. Elon thinks we're all living in a simulation. It's one giant video game. And simulation theory, as crazy as it sounds, actually has an interesting mathematical basis. Um, do you want me to tell you the math? So basically, the idea is, is that as civilizations progress, they make video games, uh, or they make movies that seem more and more real. And as technology increases, uh, these simulations get more and more realistic to the point where they are indistinguishable from reality. 
Anybody who plays video games or has kids who play video games, they're getting so much better than when we were kids, right? Every year they get better and better and better. And you can think that maybe 100 years from now, these simulations will be indistinguishable from reality. But the thing is, civilizations don't just make one simulation, they make a near infinite number of them because it just takes computing power. So you make millions and millions and millions of fake worlds that seem like the real world. If there are more than one civilization in the, in the universe, which most likely there is, they're all doing this. So at some point, uh, there are a near infinite number of simulated realities, but only one real reality. So the mathematical odds that you're living in the real reality are infinitely small. So the odds are we're all living in a simulation. That's what simulation theory is. Beyond that, because a simulation has within it billions and billions and billions of characters, all who think they're real, the odds are not only are you living in a simulation, but you're not even a real person in the simulation. You're a non-playing character. So Elon believes this. He believes he's the only real character in the simulation of all of our lives. Um, this is what he believes. And he thinks when someone comes up and tells him something, it's not really that important to him because he's the only real person in the story. And that allows him to make decisions and do things that affect everybody because he's the hero of the story. And I will say, having written about lots of billionaires, all of them sort of think this. <laughs> Every <laughs> famous billionaire I've met and talked to slightly believes the world is designed around them. Because from their point of view, everything has always worked out. It's like, and the, all these things are unlikely. It's very unlikely that you succeed to this level. A million things have to happen right for you to get there. So you start to think, well, the world must be designed around me. Um, and it's this kind of messianic, kind of weird thing, but it, it's shared by a lot of really successful people. And, but Elon just takes it to another extent. He really believes that we're in a simulation. And so um, that's part of why he's difficult to work with. Um, you know, I, I interviewed a lot of people. When you go to work for Elon, you're actually given a list of rules of how to speak to Elon. And it's, it starts off by saying, Elon is a special person, <laughs> which I agree. Um, and it goes from there to basically how you talk to him. You speak late at night. You send him memes. Everything has to be through comedy. Uh, you can never confront him in front of other people. Uh, every, and, and it's really interesting. He will fire people in the room. He will berate people in the room. There's a scene in the book where at an all-hands meeting at Twitter, someone actually just starts to question the idea of an everything app. And he just destroys this person in front of everybody. Um, berates him. I mean, this is the richest man in the world talking to some random person, and he just destroys them in front of everybody because he cannot be confronted in front of a group of people. Um, and all of this kind of goes back to the idea that this is the movie we're all in, and he's the main character. Um, and that's how he sees the world. Does anybody else here in this room? <laughs> I think there's some mathematical I think it's an interesting mathematical model. That's all I will say about simulation theory. But no, I'm probably a non-playing character too. So. <laughs> um, so a lot of people have read the new book by Walter Isaacson about Elon. I've heard of that. <laughs> How does breaking Twitter differentiate from that book besides being 370 pages shorter? <laughs> <laughs> Let me start by saying, I, some of you probably read Walter. Walter's an amazing author. Uh, Walter Isaacson is the biographer of our time. I really think he's a phenomenal writer. I think this book that he wrote is very encyclopedic. I do believe that he would not have written this book today. The Elon of a year ago was on every list of one of the smartest, most powerful men in the world, and that's the guy that he writes about. He writes about Da Vinci and Einstein and Steve Jobs. Elon today is not that guy. The Elon who's spewing anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, who's firing people in the middle of the night for nothing, um, who is really driving this site into the ground, is not the guy Walter would have written about. And if you read his book, it's really interesting because he's got so much about SpaceX and so much about Tesla and so much about Elon growing up, which is all wonderful. And then Twitter is jammed in for two chapters at the end because it happened late in his writing of it. But in my opinion, this is the most important story in Elon's life. This is the biggest story in Elon's life, and it will overshadow everything else he's done unfairly, but it will. There's a scene in my book where it's the SpaceX launch. Some of you remember it, where he first launched Starship. Starship is this beautiful, giant, stainless steel phallic symbol. It is the ultimate Elon creation, and it is going to take us to Mars, right? And this launch um, was never supposed to get very far. It's just a test launch. It launched a little bit off the thing, and then it blew up. 
And there's this great scene where all the engineers are cheering behind them on the screen is this massive explosion, right? <laughs> Every major media covered the story as Elon's failure. Now, a year ago, this story would have been covered great success. It would have been first step to Mars. There might have been ticker tech parades because this really was an important moment for space travel. But because of what Elon has done at Twitter and because of who Elon is now, it was roundly declared a failure. And that's my point, is that no matter what else Elon has done, which should overshadow Twitter, what he has done at Twitter has either revealed who he always was or has changed him to the point where we just don't see that Elon anymore. And um, that, I think, is what Walter's book is missing. Um, Walter and I are very different types of journalists. I mean, he's going to write sort of the journalistic um, account of a, of a man, the biography of a man. Well, I take a movie scene, one part of this story, and I write it in a thriller-esque cinematic style. They're both nonfiction, they're both true, but what I do is, is very different, and I don't consider myself the type of journalist that he is. But I also will say about Walter is he fell in love with his main character, um, similar to what Michael Lewis did with the SBF story. When you're a writer and you're given total access to a person, especially someone who has private jets and yachts and, and a lifestyle like that, it's very easy to fall in love with them and to write a very glowing story of them even when they commit horrible fraud, like in the case of SBF, or even when they do something horrible like Elon has done at Twitter. Um, so it's very hard for them to get away from where they already are going when something else happens in the story. And I've done it too. I mean, Janet Maslin calls me the billionaire's best friend because I've written a lot of stories where I make billionaires look really good. Um, when you're given the keys to the city, you often write the story the main character wants you to write. And it's very hard to not do that. And so this is why I often say when you are approaching a story like this, the least credible source is the main character. The person you should least believe is the center of the story because that's the one trying to sell you a story. When I wrote the book that became The Social Network, Zuckerberg spent a year refusing to talk to me. We'd go back and forth, back and forth, and in the end he knew he couldn't control what I was going to say. If he had talked to me, the Social Network would not have been a great movie. <laughs> it really wouldn't if I had listened to him, because his story was, yeah, I came up with an idea. That's not the actual story, but that's how he sees the story. And he doesn't see the Winkle by Twins, and he doesn't see Eduardo or any of the other characters in it. And similarly, Elon is just telling the Elon story, and Walter just wrote the Elon story. Um, so I don't fault him for that. That's, that's what happens when you write a book like that. But I think my story is... Um, is more cinematic, and, uh, and we'll see how that goes, yeah. Yeah, and speaking, not to get off topic, but speaking yeah. of cinematic, in Dumb Money or the Antisocial Network, that's sort of how you constructed the story. It was from, you know, you had these five characters from different walks of life, and can you speak a little bit more about how that brought that story together? Of Dumb Money? Yeah. Should we talk about Dumb Money? Yeah, for a hot, hot second, Has I think we seen could. I know a lot of you have seen Dumb Money. A lot of you are here for the last thing, yeah. Dumb Money is a great story. If any of you see it, it's now available on digital, and it's the GameStop story where basically the world went crazy for a few weeks, <laughs> and a whole bunch of people bid the price of GameStop to the point where that company was worth as much as GE. And um, it was a battle of regular people against Wall Street, um, but I really told it from the point of view of, of a bunch of different people who had bought into it, and then a bunch of the hedge fund people who were you know, on the wrong side or on the bad side of the trade. Um, but it's a dramatic sort of telling. It's what I do. It's I go inside the story and I try and talk to as many people as I can and find where the sort of dramatic and Shakespearean arcs are. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, you know, we can get more into that if people in the Q&A yes. want to talk more. We'll about get it. back to that. Yeah. Um, so speaking of you know, bringing things to the screen, we heard some tweets about the plans for breaking Twitter. Can yes. you share some, some of that? Yeah, with the breaking audience? Twitter is going to be a limited television series. We're doing it for TV for this time. It's going to probably be an eight to 10 part series. Um, MGM Studios bought it. So we're right now out to actors to find our Elon. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll be really, really a, a great part for an actor. Uh, I felt like this story um, lends itself more to the television format because now TV is so high quality now. I mean, everybody, everything you watch now, there's, they're almost like mini movies, but you can do eight hours or you can do 10 hours over a course of a season. Um, and this one, quite frankly, could be multiple seasons because it's continuing. Uh, um, but yeah, we're going to launch it as a television series, um, and it'll end up either like on Netflix or on Showtime or HBO. We'll see once we get our Elon. And I, I want Ben Affleck, I think, is our first choice because I think he's, you need someone big. Elon is a hulking guy. He's very large. 
Um, we were talking to Sasha Baron Cohen, the actor, who's a phenomenal actor. Um, Brendan Fraser's been brought up, but my guess is he'll end up in the yeah, in the more um, Walter Isaacson style movie version of it. Um, it'll be neat because there'll be a TV Elon and a movie Elon, uh, two different types of projects, but ours will come out way before the other one. So it'll be interesting to see, yeah. <laughs> and um, just a couple more questions, and then we're gonna open it up to the audience. Um, can you talk a little bit about your writing process and how you're able to You could talk write. about my writing process, <laughs> yeah. Um, In such a short amount of time. So I write very quickly, um, a story like this, <laughs> Um, I'll write a proposal first, so usually an eight to ten page treatment or proposal, which I will sell to Hollywood. Then I will sell that proposal to a book publisher, and then I will dive in first with the research, um, which can take anywhere from three weeks to longer, depending on how involved the research is. Um, and then an outline, and then once I've got an outline, I write the book in about ten weeks or eleven weeks which is not something I recommend to any of you. If you're any of you are writers out there, this is not something that you should do unless you really want to hurt yourself. Um, but I, <laughs> I write six to 10 pages every day. Um, and if it takes an hour, my day is done in an hour. And if it takes 10 hours, my day is done in 10 hours. And I always tell young writers or writers out there, um, don't write by time, write by page. Um, because if you say, I'm going to write 10 hours today, you, you're not going to get anything done. But if you say, I'm going to write three pages today, well, you might have a short day, you might have a long day, but that's your goal every day. So always write by pages, and I've done this my whole career. And at this point now, I've written 25 books. Um, you know, I know it sounds like a lot, but people only really read two of them, but I have written 25 books. Um, and my process has been honed to the point where I really can start and finish a book within three months. Um, so from the idea to finish book is three months, and the movie is sold before I write the book, so there's a screenwriter already working on it. There's a studio. And it doesn't mean it'll get made. 99% of things don't get made. Um, but it gives you a much better chance of something actually getting to a screen. Um, yeah, and so my process is really frantic and insane, as you know. Yeah. Um, time is a big part of my practice. I, we always start sitting. Um, we used to go to the food court in the Prudential Center, but they took away our food court and put an eatily in it. It's too fancy for us. But we will <laughs> sit at lunch and go through sort of the idea of how how we're gonna develop it. So she's a big part in my coming up with the outline. But for me, the outline is everything. The outline is like the skeleton, and after that, it's just putting the flesh on the body. The skeleton is by far the most important part. My outline is so detailed that I know the page number of every chapter, and I never miss by a page. So it, literally, the outline will be 50 pages long. Um, and then the book is just filling that out to 300 pages. You're like the Michael Jordan of writers. Right, exactly. <laughs> just like that. No, but I, I'm, I'm, I've honed a practice over many years. I will say what's interesting is I hand in the book and there's almost no editing. Um, I don't re-edit it. I write one draft and it goes in. And there may be a few little things, but there's no real rewrite, um, which is over the years I've reached that point because I know what they're going to ask for. So while I'm writing it, I already know what the editor would want changed before I hand it in. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's just how I do it. And it's the reason I think I've been able to cultivate a good relationship with Hollywood is because they know if a big story breaks, like right now the whole AI story is breaking, and I'm getting continuous phone calls. Because if I plant my flag and say I'm going to write a book, they know they'll have a book in three months. Um, and that'll put them ahead of, you know, anybody except for Michael Lewis or Walter Isaacson. So basically, if <laughs> Michael Lewis and Walter Isaacson don't do it, then I'm going to do it. But if the two of them are going to do it, then I step back and let them do it. Although you're faster than they are. I'm faster. <laughs> I'm faster. That's one of the things I've got going for me. Uh, so so what, what's next in line for you? Yeah, I mean, I don't know my next book yet. We're making a television show out of this. My book, Once Upon a Time in Russia, that some of you might have heard of, about the Russian oligarchs who put Putin into power, that's going to be Peter Morgan's next show after The Crown. So it's going to be on Netflix. He's developing it now. He actually wrote it as a play already called The Patriot, which is going to be coming to Broadway. And um, so it's based on my book, and it will be a television show on Netflix. So that'll be really, really cool. Um, not really supposed to talk about that, but I just did. OK. So. Well, there forget you, you uh, heard no, that. And, um, <laughs> uh, we're making a movie out of a couple of my other books. Wooly is one about the Wooly Mammoth coming back to life. A bunch of scientists in Boston are remaking the Wooly Mammoth. That's going to be a movie. Um, the people who are making the Wooly Mammoth are making the movie which is pretty interesting. Um, and then, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a documentary. I'm working on a documentary about um, uh, Jeffrey Kent, um, who created Safari Travel. He's a, Abercrombie & Kent is the company. This man is like Errol Flynn. This guy has gone down the Amazon all the way, first man down the Amazon, first man at the pyramids, 
brought, uh, he's been in hostages, he's nearly died five times, his life is like a movie, so I'm working on a documentary about him. But I'm open, I'm looking for my next big book, um, so I'm always keeping my eyes open if anybody has great suggestions. But, but anyways, hey, thank you all so much. Yes, thank you guys.